and we're back. So without further ado, as we uh, kind of chomped out a couple of minutes, uh, I'm very excited and very happy to introduce to you Sam Gallo, professor at uh, the University of Austin, Texas in Italian study. He's actually very fluent in Italian, but <laughs> for today we'll be forcing Sam to to speak in English. And I mean, uh, let's without Further ado, uh, his content is called Giocare per Immagini, Codified Illustrations and Visual Shorthands in Magic the Gathering, and it's going to be our keynote speech for the day. Um, yeah, let's go straight ahead. Sure. <laughs> Yours the chair. Okay, fantastic. I'm so excited to be here. So um, like Tiziano said, my, my, my talk is called Giocare per Immagini, and that's kind of a play on words from my favorite Italian photographer, Luigi Ghirri. So I figured I could be transcontinental here and um, and get back to my Italian roots and my Italian studies and merge that with Magic the Gathering as I often do in my videos. If you've watched my videos, you'll know that I kind of start somewhere totally unrelated to magic and come back to magic. So that's what I'm trying to do here with this, uh, with this talk. So the subtitle is, of course, Codified Illustrations and Visual Shorthands in Magic the Gathering. And we're going to break down both of those segments today um, underneath the title. So this is the image I'm pulling inspiration from. This is an image that Luigi Ghirri took kind of spontaneously of a newspaper in the in the road. And close on closer vision, you see come pensare per immagini. This became the thesis statement of Ghirri's work. Uh, if I had to translate it uh, in English, it would be how to think with images or thinking through images. Uh, that preposition there, per, can be interpreted in multiple ways. Um, but how to think with or through images is exactly uh, is exactly what we're trying to do today in, in, in the context of Magic the Gathering. So really quickly, there's Luigi Ghirri, who was born in 1943, and he died suddenly of a heart attack in uh, 1992 at the age of 49. And he was just a maestro. He was a virtuoso in, uh, in the realm of photography. Here's one quick photo that I love of Giri that um, that kind of illuminates how how clever he was visually with the camera. Uh, he was he was very fond of a visual pun. So the clouds in the background here against the telephone wires sort of it shows a um, it's a play on a, a kind of like musical notation. Uh, you can easily imagine a treble clef to the left and the um, a sort of descending scale of notes uh, as the clouds paint through the. Uh, telephone wires. And this is exactly the essence of Geary's work. Here's another beautiful image of Geary. Um, if you've been to the Colosseo, I mean, I don't know how he, he, he pictured such a tranquil and easygoing scene. It's nothing like that now. Um, but this is another one of my favorites. And finally, this is the final image that Geary took before he died. This is the last image that we have of his um, that was burnt into the film, the undeveloped film. Um, it, he was a landscape surveyor and he saw the world through the lens of, uh, uh, of a landscape surveyor, but he still had such a, a profound artistic quality. Um, this is the very humble Po Valley. If you've been to the Po Valley, you know that um, La Nebbia, the fog, is a, is a key element of that area of the world. And looking at this makes me very melancholic and nostalgic for... Um, for my time spent in Ferrara, which is my home away from home. And uh, I use Giri's images. The essence of his work is, is in everything I do. So I'd like to start with a quote from Giri to sort of paint our, the, the sort of structure exactly what I'd like to speak about in terms of magic today. So this is Giri saying, I've always been attracted to the photograph and the song precisely because they are not considered art. Art with a capital A. Um, this is a beautiful first. This is a three kind of there's the quote is divided into three parts. But this idea of capital A art is like something we we often struggle with in the world of Magic the Gathering and fantasy illustration at large. There's this stigma that it's not considered art because it's games. But that's hopefully what we're trying to destroy today. So Giri saw the photograph and song uh, as as more ephemeral pieces of art, art that disappears and has no material. Unlike Titanic museum pieces, which seem deemed to sink, photographs and songs are great and altogether healthy forms of fragility and tenderness. Fragility and tenderness, unlike the Titanic museum pieces. Um, and this is the conclusion of the quote. He says, they have always seemed to me like moments of illumination, visionary flares that appear before us and go on to become part of life. And that final part is exactly what I want to get at with magic. 
um, various elements of magic, the art side of magic, go on to become part of life. The game experience, the act of play occurs in a space and in a time, but it has this beautiful remnant element to it. And Giri saw that in photography. You know, photography is capturing a moment that will never exist again, but nonetheless, it becomes part of life in an immaterial way. So with that, I transition to magic as I do often in my videos, <laughs> this kind of hard cut, let's go to magic. Um, what I'm showing you is a, uh, is a quick screenshot of the World Magic Cup from 2015. For those of you who are not familiar with magic, this is basically what it looks like on the tabletop. Um, we have two players here on the left is a player from Thailand and on the right is the is a player from Italy and cards are strewn about and at a quick glance every every player that plays magic kind of already knows what, what we're looking at here they can dissect the 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 image immediately um, and hopefully by the end of my speech if you if you aren't interested in magic or have never played before I this will give you a nice lay of the land. So just coincidentally, this is total coincidence, okay? Uh, that was also the year that Italy won the World Magic Cup. So uh, of course you see our, our cohort of Italians, Mangucci and Camiluzzi and, and everyone celebrating as they defeated Thailand uh, and, and won the World Magic Cup. Let's pretend for a second, if we go back to this image, that these two players do not speak a common tongue, that, uh, that perhaps they were fully speaking in Italian on one side and fully speaking uh, you know, in, in Eastern languages on the left side, and they had no common ground, the game can still take place. And my question is why, how, how, how is it possible that you can navigate an entire competition, an entire tournament without some sort of uh, dialogue? And what I'm going to argue today is that's because magic has illustrations. They can play through the images. You, you, you enact the, uh, the act of playing magic through illustrations. And there's kind of this ongoing stigma and joke in the pro community that m many magic pros, these, these people, you know, would be, would be part of that demographic think that, oh, I don't care much about the fantasy element. I really don't care about art and illustration. All I care about are mechanics and numbers. I care about uh, the game elements. And I argue that it's easy to say that, but none of this would be possible without the illustrations fundamentally. And I'd hope to get to the bottom of that today. So again, a total coincidence that I just happened to choose the match when Italy won, but hey, here we are. Okay, so playing with images, this talk kind of is divided into three bullet points. Um, you know, Tiziano in the call for papers asked, how important are images within the gaming experience? And it's a very simple question, but it could lead, lead us into beautiful tangents. How important are they? I think they're fundamental. <laughs> uh, the, next, uh, the next idea here is, Breaking down this idea of codified illustrations, um, my questions guiding this idea is how are illustrations commissioned so that they can be intuitively understood at the nonverbal level? And this is the question of art directors as well as the illustrators who create these images. They are constantly negotiating with this question. How can we make sure that the illustrations are so quickly understood and so structured into categories that they can be intuitively understood at the nonverbal level by, by the players. Next, I'd like to look at uh, this idea of visual shorthands. I mean, how do magic players communicate through and ultimately play with images? How can we, uh, you know, if you know the preposition per, it's impossible to translate. Uh, uh, how do we play with or through these images? And how do they become visual shorthands that then lead us into this idea of magic and memory? How do illustrations then become mementos of a shared experience between two players? And how does that sentiment share an affinity with photographs, you know, in my example with Geary at the beginning, and by extension, all forms of art? How, how, do, we, how do we create a moment of shared experience together and then those illustrations and those cards become representative of our time together and, and exist, like Geary said, they go on to become part of life. So. I want to make a disclaimer. I'm very much not speaking about uh, UX today. It's not about frames. Um, I, you know, kind of if you look at a typical magic card, as I have done here, you can break it up into two visual elements. Primarily, you have the card frame, which for everything I'll, ta I'll talk about today could also be applied and even uh, elaborated on within the world of the card frame itself. But I'm explicitly speaking about paintings. 
I'm only speaking about illustrations here. So that's my disclaimer. Everything we could talk about with frames, we could also talk about uh, with, uh, with illustrations and vice versa. So let's break down these, these codes. So this is a this is an this is a painting by Volkenbaga called uh, Elspeth Knight Errant, and even without knowing anything about magic at all, if you know nothing about magic, you can immediately get some sensations and and um, understands the codes that are that are embedded into this painting. We have we have a heroic figure that has been adorned in in armor with this beautiful flowing cape in a sort of autumnal setting, and and immediately we know that this is an important person within the game world. There are so many levels of, of drawing upon previous information and our understanding of paintings that communicate that this is a hero. We know it fundamentally immediately. Uh, this is what Elspeth looks like on her card. And this is kind of the first category of, of cards if we want to break down art into these very, very simplified categories is how it appears in Magic. Uh, the first category are the planeswalkers, and like I said, they are the heroes and also the villains of of the game. Um, they also uh, uh, depict usually the the art direction commands a vertical orientation, a full body portrait, a heroic pose. We want to we want to we want to showcase our 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 best most important figures, and uh, there's there's a specific a very narrow and specific type of way that they do that. And they want to glamorize and, and deify the game's protagonists and antagonists. And they do this through primarily the illustration and then subsequently through the, the card frame. I want to argue that there is no way that it, you fundamentally cannot confuse a planeswalker with any of the game's other creatures and monsters because they are visually distinct. They are, vis they are elevated to a level, like I said, they are deified. These are the VIPs. They aren't the normal people, the normal inhabitants, the normal, uh, you know, uh, uh, creatures of a plane or of a world. They are the most important ones, and and because of that, we can look at these images and 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 draw upon that immediately. Here's another easy one. Uh, here's another. This is the second category of magic illustrations. This is a land. <laughs> there's no there's no if and or buts about it. That's a land. And this is what it looks like in the card frame. This is uh, an island by Stephen Belladin that I love from the Greek-inspired world of Theros. Um, the second category of magic illustrations are these. They're landscapes. They 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 serve to 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 show off the world-building efforts. And in, in the context of the game, lands are magic's resource system. So it serves to to make sure that those are also very distinct from the the spells with which you use your resources on which you use your resources. Primarily, they're a traditional landscape. You'll notice they're also horizontally oriented for the most part. Um, they, they, again, they're sweeping vistas that show off the world building efforts and place us on a plane. Okay, that's their primary visual function. Uh, secondly, I should say that uh, they cannot also, they cannot be confused with other card types. There's no way you look at this and think, ah, oh, that's a planeswalker. No, no, no. They are they are absolutely the locations where where all of these events transpire and all of these figures live. And of course, you know, if you were an art director, all you would say is, "Hey, don't paint a figure there. Never paint a human in those lands." And of course, they've broken that rule a couple of times over the years, but primarily speaking, this is very simple. This is where the magic happens, okay? Here's the third uh Here's the third category. Uh, this is Thriving Ibex by Siddharth Shachavedi from the um, from the Kaladesh expansion. And this marks our, our third sort of type of illustration, which is creatures. Okay. So we have the VIPs, we have the lands, and then we have the inhabitants of these planes, these fantasy worlds. Um, and this is this is kind of the primary gameplay mechanic in magic. This is exactly what magic's all about. You use your lands to make to make your creatures, and with creatures you go through combat. Um, and so uh, these can be humanoid or non-humanoid. It doesn't matter. It depends on where we are. But by and large, it's it's very intuitive. They again are the inhabitants of planes. The creatures show off the world building efforts, and they place us on a plane. They inhabit the world. It's as simple as that. But unlike planeswalkers and lands, creatures don't they they exist in a gray space in terms of the game's visual language 
they they shouldn't be confused with other card types and other game pieces but often is the case that there is a gray area that i want to explore and the ripple effects of that gray area um, sometimes can really confuse gameplay next up we have spells this is counter spell by ryan yi from a recent set a beautiful image of a, of a of a wizard of sorts kind of casting a radiant spell and uh, that could be category four um, yeah, they, they, they are a supplementary gameplay mechanic to the creatures. Magic is about creatures and spells. Uh, and these, these are, the, like I, I describe them as the verbs of the visual language. Uh, they, are, they show actions and events. They show stuff happening uh, where the creatures kind of show off a portrait, more of a portrait. Uh, the spells are really about what's going on, that cinematic, almost comic book moment of our creatures doing stuff. And similarly, they shouldn't be confused with other card types, but often is the case that, well, sometimes is the case that that actually happens. Um, finally, maybe we can reduce this to uh, to the things of the world. So this is uh, Lindsay Look. This is Marble Diamonds, one of my favorite illustrations of hers, uh, just an expert of painting hands. Um, so the category five is just the things, you know, it's the stuff in the in the in the periphery. We can get equipment and books, magical items and vehicles. Uh, the stuff in the world is just as important as the, the people in the, in the world as well. And it's a supplemental mechanic in magic. It's, it's not the primary way typically that the game wants to be played, but nonetheless, it adds to those world building efforts and makes a place believable. It lends to the, to the lived in feeling of a world. Um, if the spells are the verbs, then the artifacts are the nouns of the game's visual language. And largely speaking, it's pretty clear when you're looking at an artifact because it's a thing. You know, you can tell that this is emphasized by just just showing a figure's hand and not their face um, because we're drawing attention to the diamond and not the person handling it. So so these are the the sort of five let's say five super broad and there's a lot more nuance than you know i could i could go into detail but largely speaking this is the codified language of magic you're looking at magic right here uh, this is what it looks like and this is how it plays you're ready to play um, what i've noticed from looking at this is players i argue are extremely extremely in tune with these categories even if they're unaware of art directors and illustrators and world builders, even if they're the pro players that I showed at the beginning who don't pay attention to art descriptions and, and paintings, they're still nonetheless really in tune with these categories. They know them fundamentally at a subconscious level. Um, and when this order is disturbed, when any sort of shift in this very codified visual language takes place, then gameplay is severely affected. And that to me points out this phenomenon in magic that we are enacting a mechanical uh, uh, kind of dance interplay during play, but nonetheless, it is filtered through the visual language of the game. So anytime we have an upset in this, this kind of structure, these pillars, then gameplay is affected, which again points to this idea that uh, yes, at the end of the day, we could play with numbers, but maybe we couldn't. Here's an example. Uh, I, I pulled a quick card from back in the day in 1995, Mystic Remora. Uh, the, you know, part of, uh, part of coming into magic is learning that this isn't a creature, even though it kind of looks like one. So you have a big fish here and you have the name of a fish, Mystic Remora. Ooh, that should be a creature. It should be part of the thriving Ibex category, but instead it's actually part of the counterspell category. It's an action, it's a verb, it's an effect on the world, it's an enchantment. And that can't be deduced immediately just from the illustration. So now we're in the gray area. And sometimes players get confused when they look at this illustration because they assume it's a creature. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the visual shorthands that magic exists on. Uh, similarly, this is from the same set, it's Snow Devil. It would be very quick and easy to... Um, to assume this is a creature, but in fact, it isn't. Here's one from a more recent set that Kelly Diggs brought to me, and I love as a quick example of when, when art direction and game mechanics collide in a bad way. So we're looking at two cards that both have a siren in their artwork, have a siren in their title. They're both the same color, and they're both from the same set. And largely speaking, the composition is almost equal as well. On the left, you have a siren, you know, with her wings out. And on the right, you have a siren with their wings out. 
but they are totally different cards. So when these, when these, when these codes, when these separate categories meld, that will create huge, there's huge ramifications in the gameplay. And again, it's because magic is using the visual language as a shorthand to navigate its game systems. I could say this exact same kind of uh, situation about these two cards, both from the same set, both the same colors uh, in terms of uh, the casting cost and also just illustration. Within the illustration, we have largely the same composition and this creates confusion. This creates confusion in players because players don't have the time or the mental bandwidth to read every single card. We just go off of the illustrations to play. So I should say that also whenever we have special editions of cards, then we, uh, you know, we, we these these special editions can exacerbate these gray areas to an extreme. Uh, I'll show you a quick example of a card that was made at the very beginning of the game, 1993. Cards looked like this on the left for a very long time. This is a prototypical magic card through and through. And on the right is a, a newer version of a magic card that is experimenting with graphical design elements. This was a crossover with the, the art project Mischief. You're looking at two totally different magic cards. And anytime something like that on the right comes out, uh, we're... we're we're introducing new visual language to those code systems, and that can create a lot of confusion. And it also creates this ongoing kind of tongue in cheek complaints. I hear a lot. This is not a magic card, right? This is not a magic. That's not a magic card. It doesn't look like a magic card. When I hear this complaint, I, I notice two things. The first is that um, this complaint sort of highlights this subconscious sensibility that we have for the game's established codified visual language. What I mean by that is there is a sense of what should a, a card should look like. And when we don't have those those beats met, then then there's a dis the, 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 the presumption that magic players from which they operate when they play is disturbed. And it highlights this sensibility that we all have as magic players. I argue too that special edition cards like this really pressure players' mental bandwidth while playing. I mean, it's hard to keep track of so many game elements, but when you introduce new game elements like this, it really puts the pressure on them. Okay. And these cards are disarming. They're intrusive to the game at the micro level, even though they are fun aesthetically. So again, returning to this scenario, we have lands on the right and, uh, you know, lands on the outside and the creatures in the middle. And this is largely what happens uh, in a game of magic. Here's another example from another pro tour. Um, at a quick glance, if you've been playing the game a long time, you can deduce exactly what's happening almost instantaneously in these scenarios. And you don't even have to read the cards. In fact, it's impossible to read the cards from here. You just know intuitively what's happening because of this quick macro level glance. And it's only through illustrations that are we able to keep track of so many game pieces at once. No matter how complex the board becomes, uh, magic players can reduce this into a very narrow corridor because of illustrations. So these are the visual shorthand elements. These are the conclusions I came to, you know, as players navigate a typical game of magic, they're negotiating with all these micro details and keeping track of multiple layers of mechanical complexity through the codified illustrations on their cards. They're keeping track of all this because it's so rigid. Illustrations provide a conduit through which players and by extension, the audience, we can participate in the act of play. We can watch tournaments. We can watch gameplay because we have illustrations as the as the reference point. Um, and that's the only way that this game could ever be played. Then when the typical codes are broken, that's when play breaks down, either because you don't know what the card does or you can't recognize the card. That's when gameplay slows down and comes to a halt. It's fluid when, when, the, when the rules are, are followed. Players use illustrations, whether they realize it or not, to manage their co cognitive load. And this is where I kind of laugh again at the pros who think we could play magic with just numbers and text. I'm like, uh-uh, nope. We're using illustrations all, all the time, all the time to manage our cognitive load. So this segues me to the third and final points of this idea, and it goes back to Geary. This is kind of a sentence I wrote this morning. These illustrations... 
through all of these, uh, through the codified language and through the act of play, then become totemic keepsakes of the act of play. And I want to show that to you. I want to prove that to you. I want to show you that illustrations do then become like photographs, uh, representations of a time past. Uh, no one, you know, if you if you talk to a magic player, I mean, magic players will recognize this painting immediately, depending on what era of uh, of life they come from in the game. Um, so, so this is Noble Hierarch by Mark Sugg, who we'll be hearing from soon. That's that's delightful. Everyone that plays magic, you know, eventually gets a piece of art framed in their house. Either it's the original painting or it's a print. But I'd be hard pressed to find someone that just frames the rules text, <laughs> you know, even though that is ultimately what they are commemorating. They're commemorating the game mechanics and the game play. It's always through the filter of the illustration. And that's what becomes the memento. <laughs> and actually, this is kind of funny. I, I put it in the frame. I'm like, oh, that'd be kind of funny. That'd be a silly tongue in cheek joke, you know, just like frame some rules text. But no, it's the case that we 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 experience the game through the illustrations. Okay. So this is my final point, magic and memory. Uh, if you know this painting, it's Thoughtseize by Alexei Briclo. And, uh, and this is the first time that this paint, this card was painted. It's been reprinted four different times with four different illustrations. And depending again, when you came into the game, this illustration may mean a lot to you, or it may mean nothing at all. But the important part here is that the card has never changed mechanically. So the mechanics of the card have remained exactly the same for, uh, you know, 15 years, but the illustrations have changed four times. So this was the original printing. This was the printing in 2013 in the, uh, in the, in the set Theros. Um, and this is, I was, I came back to the game in Theros. So I, I have distinct memories myself of playing around this version of the card. Uh, so when I look at this, I, I'm immediately taken back to my friends and my game store um, in a way that can, I can't be transported like this. Importantly, when I was playing around this time in Magic's past, the old, you know, the old uh, guard or the OGs, you know, they were playing with this version of the card because that was more evocative of, uh, and representational of their experience with the game. Then a few years later in Amonkhet, we had an invocation of Thoughtseize printed. And I have no, I have no shared experience with this version of the card. And fundamentally, I have this is from 2020. This is even further removed from my experience with the card. So so these, so these are all, again, they're mementos. They're those ephemeral takeaways from the game. Um, all, all, all four of these cards will mean something entirely different to different players, depending on where they were introduced to the game. And, and it's only through the illustrations that that, that, that sense of, uh, 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 of memory can exist. Uh, again, because the card has not changed mechanically. So what you'll often find in magic are people that gravitate to those cards that represent some, some sort of distant memory, much like a photograph. Uh, in their in their past, so yeah, so you know, we could talk about uh, uh, which version of Thoughtsees you prefer. That usually is a bigger question than it may seem. You know, what kind of Thoughtsees are you running in your deck? Uh, will tell you a lot about a player. So uh, I'll, I'll I'll conclude with Geary's quote again. I've always been attracted to the photograph and the song precisely because they are not considered art. Capital A art. Unlike Titanic museum pieces, which seem deemed to sink, photographs and songs are great and altogether healthy forms of fragility and tenderness. They've always seemed to me like moments of illumination, visionary flares that appear before us and go on to become part of life. You know, this was the visionary, this was the visionary flare that, 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 that manifested as an illustration and then became part of our lives uh, and still become part of our lives 15 years and counting. So there's Alexi holding his painting of thought seas. And, uh, you know, I think this, even this image alone can evoke a lot from, from players of the game. So thank you. Grazie mille. That's me. Sam, thank you so much. We were really looking forward to hear your talk and you delivered quite a bit. I mean, like, walking through the significance of magic the gathering images by walking hand in hand with giri 
we, we didn't expect that. And uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the poor the po picture is also evocative as it's just, I mean, we are between Modena and Reggio Emilia right now. Mm -hmm. So it's like <laughs> b behind the corner is, is in these places. And I mean, uh, we, okay. I mean, w once you come visiting Italy, we'll go there definitely. But I mean, the, l l let's shut up with the, with the starstruck me. <laughs> and, uh, there's just one question from our wonderful Nicolò Toccafondi, which I think you kind of already answered, actually. He was asking, uh, is this the kind of pressure in mental bandwidth that you are referring to? I mean, I think you, you already answered that. Uh, as Nicolò, tomorrow, will be talking about a very interesting study that he is mm, taking over about the aesthetic values in uh, loot box content uh, within mm -hmm. like uh, online gaming and how I mean this refers to uh, translates to willingness to pay by individuals. Uh, I think uh, I have just very mm, one quick question as we actually need to go to the next content and Andrea is another. Uh, real quick, uh, when it was really striking to see the secret layers uh, like of re, uh, war, rework of the image compared to the old source to plowshares. And as we were talking about this topic a little bit this morning, was it a sort of excess of aesthetics? I mean, is there like a sort of tension between le le what you call the UX experience and I mean, a sort of excess of signature artist element in those cases i mean it's like the a picture has been reframed by miss chief so we we can even talk about some sort of brand involvement if we mm -hmm. want to take it from a critical studies point and i was thinking that uh, somehow the more there is an excess of aesthetics and the less the the use is uh, is effective and uh, i mean in a very like wide time frame we are talking about what kind of use uh, people made of images back in the Middle Ages when people were, were going to churches and Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome and learned the Bible by watching images and, and there the use was really strict. And then as much as we go towards the chapter of art history, this use somehow gets diluted. And I was wondering if you, I don't know, have been thinking about this when you were comparing those two source to plowshares. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, that is the risk that uh, we we run when we choose to make cards that don't look like old cards. And it sets a new paradigm. And the total dissolution of the rules is in, in itself an aesthetic. So so it is something you can play with. And, and from the art director standpoint or the player themselves, uh, when you establish these, it's only through the establishment of these extremely narrow, not narrow, but strong codified visual elements that you're allowed to do something that's totally different and it will stand out because of that. So in and of itself, there is a huge gap between what we consider a magic card and what we don't. And when you explore what we don't for so long, then, uh, then we might find the pendulum swing back to just plain old magic cards but it's about pushing that boundary. And even, even the gradient in between kind of represents some potential. So you're right that it, there is the biggest risk of experimenting with these types of cards is that it pressures the, the player's cognitive load because they don't have that point of reference. And that's masked even further by another layer of aesthetic confusion. A lot of those cards, those experimental cards are really hard to read fundamentally let alone kind of relate to. So um, ultimately, I think it's about exposure. You know, we could probably have this same talk in 10 years and we will look at the new swords to plowshares against an even weirder swords to plowshares and think, ah, that's when we, at least we were making magic cards, you know, back in 2022. So yeah, it's this constant evolution and tension between what we find to be pure or, or, or normal and the, and the new developments uh, pushing that boundary against itself. So, yeah. Very interesting. Andrea. Yes, I have a question that is close to that one and say that uh, Magic is almost uh, 30 years old now. In the beginning, all the players, all the Magic players was a new player. And so we are talking uh, and uh, fixing a new language and visit language. Now we have to uh, to be bots friendly with all player that must be sure to be playing magic and new player 
that have a, at least three generations uh, new than the, than the old players and we have to talk with their own language. How can you combine these two, uh, two things together? Yeah, I, I I think it's I think it's a uh, I think it's really important that older players or veteran players have uh, something to point at that is their own, and it actually helps kind of uh, you know it kind of helps it not form a hierarchy of sorts, but it at least forms a generational element to the game, and it's a way that Magic can celebrate its own age. Since it's been going for 30 years and it's still going strong, it's delightful that the older players, the one, the most enfranchised from the very beginning, can point at a magic card and say, ha, this is what it used to be for me, you know, and this is what it is for you. So that's kind of a nice, uh, unintentional, maybe intentional or otherwise uh, effect of changing the cards so extremely for these new secret layers and such because it again distinguishes these generational elements that uh, that make up the game. So so you're right, uh, ultimately the game can be communicated through the mechanics. At the end of the day, if you read the card, it explains the card. So um, so regardless of all the visual confusion, uh, magic still is has that anchor point which is which is the, the text. So um, so you're right. So I think that uh, I think that's the generate again, a, 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 to me, the generational element of magic is 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 real. And it's nice that the cards reflect those generations. OK, so without further ado, Sam, thank you so much. This has been such an honor and a pleasure. Please come back for the next time. You will actually come back for the next content as you will join the, the round table, which Absolutely. is following. Uh, please, the audience, uh, just, just give us a couple of minutes as we fix the, the stream yard with the other speakers. And if starstruckness isn't enough, the next one is going to be like bonkers level. Okay. Even for me, you're right. Grazie mille, grazie ancora. No, it was my piacere, okay? Gra gra grazie a te, Sam. Thank you so much. See you in a bit. Sounds good.